from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, Marie has published four real books and one collection. Her first book, which was published in 2001, was American Chica, a memoir of her life with her parents, her American mother and Peruvian father. Her, her next book was a novel, Cellophane, for which I ha feel a particular devotion since it's dedicated to me. Um, then another novel, Lima Nights, which just recently, incidentally, has been translated into Spanish and has been, and been published by a small house in Peru, which is in itself very exciting because Peruvian book publishing is a, is a very um, small undertaking. And she is now, and is here today, to talk to you about her biography of Simone Bolivar. And one of the things that I hope you will learn as you, we get through the afternoon is how to pronounce his name. Um, for a long time, before I met Marie, I thought he, he was Simone de Beauvoir. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, North Americanos, uh, in their exquisite ignorance of all things Latin America, pronounce him almost anything, ex Simon Bolivar in particular. Um, well, it's Simon Bolivar. Um, I have been watching this book as it began as a research project several years ago. And I was perhaps a bit less closely involved with its research and writing than I had been with some of her previous work. I did read it halfway through and finished, and then another time. I have to tell you that I felt about Bolivar when I first read it, as I felt about when I read the first chapter of Cellophane. I simply could not believe that my wife had written this. It was that good. Um, I'm obviously biased, but I think that you're about to be talked to by the author of the best book of the year in, the, in this country, a, 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 an opinion that is only slightly shaped by personal feelings. It's, a, it's an absolutely magnificent book, and she talks about it with great passion. It is the latest installment in her ongoing effort to help North Americans understand her native Latin America. Marie? Thank you very much, John. Wow, is that an unusual, ingrown sort of thing, right? Being introduced by your husband. And darling, why don't you say all those nice things to me across the dinner table? <laughs> very nice, thank you. Um, I also want to thank the Library of Congress, which uh, is the place where I did all of my research for this book and uh, the place to which I've come to uh, work in the librarian's office in the office of Dr. James Billington, which is in itself a tremendous honor and a privilege. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming out here tonight and braving the tempests and the rain. I mean, I've, you know, I've just written a book about a man who, who um, braved this sort of thing and then some. I mean, there are stories, of course, of Bolivar's armies wading through waist-high uh, water after inundations of, of storms like this. So I think it's fitting, in a way, for us to be doing something difficult today. So I thank you for doing something difficult with me in the rain today um, at this wonderful festival. I wrote this book, uh, as John says, because this is a campaign of mine, a personal Bolivarian campaign, you can call it, um, in which I'd like to explain who Latin Americans are, and in the process, explain who Hispanic Americans are, because one comes from the other, naturally, through history. And in the course of that explanation, I've gone from a memoir to two novels, one a family saga, one a very short, sharp, stark book about love between races, and now Bolivar. And you know, it's almost, they all, it doesn't make sense that you would go from memoir to novel to novel to biography. But to me, it makes quintessential sense because it is, ev everyone is a brick to explain something more about the identity and the character of Latin American people. 
Now, Bolivar's life is one of history's most dramatic canvases. It is a colossal narrative, really, filled with adventure and romance and victory and defeat, driven by his vision of a free United South America. One man, think about this, one man single-handedly conceived, organized, and led the liberation of a vast portion of the continent, a region that had suffered under Spain's colonial boot for 300 years. Some of his campaigns were disastrous, far more were victorious. His wars of independence took 14 years, freed a landmass the size of modern Europe, and led to the establishment of no less than six republics. In the course of a devastating violence. He was beaten often and exiled twice, but he always came back more fierce after his failures. The art of victory, he said, is learned in defeat. And his life story is a testimony to that. It's a splendid tale of reversals, of David besting Goliath, of resounding military feats and unimaginable physical endurance. It was during his second exile, when he was spit out of Venezuela after liberating Caracas, and he had been slammed back, even after he had been called a liberator, he had been slammed back by Spain's wild, marauding legions of hell, that Bolivar decided that the only way he was going to be able to achieve his goals was to widen the revolution and to engage all of the races. For as much as he tried, he was never able to secure any help from the United States of America, from the newly formed United States of America, or official England, or Republican France. Instead, he turned to the blacks, to the Indians and the mulattoes and the mestizos of Venezuela and Colombia, and he got help from the shipping merchants who were floating around the Caribbean trying to make money, and from the newly free blacks of Haiti, and from the pirates of the Caribbean, and from the mixed race cowboys of the bleak Venezuelan plains. And he got help from invalids in hospitals and from boy soldiers who were as young as 12 years old. And to populate his armies, he liberated slaves a full half century before the Emancipation Proclamation. Bolivar came to understand with a higher moral instinct, perhaps, than George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, that it doesn't make sense to pursue a war of independence if you don't first free your slaves. Now, some reviewers have said, and it makes me happy that my book reads like a novel, it, if it does, it's not because of my vivid imagination. I found all the color that I needed in the history itself, in the primary documents, in Bolivar's letters. There are more than 2,500 books about Bolivar in the Library of Congress. Bolivar's writing is brisk, lively, full of opinion and passion and drama. He wrote on the battlefield, he wrote on the fly, he wrote on long slogging expeditions, and he liked to write, especially in ballrooms. He loved to dance, and he said, I think best on my feet. And he would dance with the prettiest women in the room, and then he'd dash off to the back, and uh, he would dictate three, four, or five letters at a time. Uh, and he said, a lot of people need solitude to do their best thinking. I think, I think best while I'm dancing. Remarkable, really, because his language actually does dance a bit. When his words weren't enough, I turned to um, the, the chronicles of his contemporaries. And one of the most vibrant accounts that I found, and I found this at the Library of Congress, um, was a story that was told by a painter who painted probably the most famous portraits of Bolivar. His name was uh, Jose Maria Espinosa, and he was a very young soldier when he went off with Bolivar. And um, he took along his uh, paper and his pen and he drew Bolivar in all, at all points. But he was actually also fighting this war. 
And um, he tells a story of standing on the road from, to, from Boyacá to Bogotá. And uh, the, the Republican forces had just streamed over the most impossible point in the Andes, come down over the mountains after a, a, an extraordinary feat, really, of going up to 15,000 feet high into the cold of the, of the mountaintops, impa impassable, sort of thought to be impassable mountaintops. And they had come down to fight the Battle of Boyacá. And these, this painter uh, and his friends are standing on the roadside, and they see a man galloping down the road towards Bogotá. And they think, oh, this is one of those uh, Spaniards who are fleeing, because at that point, the Spaniards scared to death because the forces had come down over the mountains scared out of their wits, were flying. The viceroy himself put on a greasy poncho and a hat so that he would look like a peasant and slunk off into the night. Um, and down the road comes this man. The soldiers, the Republican soldiers that are stand, standing there think this must be a Spaniard. And so they go running out and they put up their lance and they say, halt. And the man does not halt. He keeps on riding. He is his poncho, is, or his cape rather, not a poncho. His cape is flying in the wind. He has bare chested, his coat is raggedy, his hair is long, it's flying in the wind. Uh, he's got a beard uh, days long. He's skinny and wretched looking, but he's riding and he's not stopping. And uh, the men raise their lances again and uh, the man on the horse stops for a second and he says, soy yo, it's me. No seas pendejo, which means don't be a dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> now, how can you get better than that for historical research? That became the first scene in, in my uh, book. And there were plenty of scenes like that in the original, in the primary documents. Bolivar was 36 years old when he fought the Battle of Boyacá. And although he would die of tuberculosis 11 years later, and many dozens of battles later, he seemed at that moment, at 36, vibrant and strong and filled with a boundless energy. For all of his physical slightness, and he was only five foot six and 130 pounds, there was an undeniable intensity to the man. His eyes were piercing black, his gaze was unsettling, his forehead was deeply lined, even as a young man, his cheekbones were high, carved, his teeth were perfect and white, and his smile was surprising and radiant. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He bathed twice, sometimes three times a day. Uh, official portraits show a rather mm, unimposing man. Meager chest, very thin legs, hands as small and as beautiful as a woman's. But when Bolivar entered a room, his power was palpable. When he spoke, his voice was galvanizing. He had a charisma that seemed to dwarf other men. He enjoyed good cuisine, but he could stand days, even weeks, of punishing starvation. And he spent backbreaking hours in campaigns that took him from one colony to another, right down uh, the landmass of Latin America. By the end, he had traveled 75 thousand miles on horseback or muleback. And I want you to think about that for a moment. That's like going from the tip of Alaska to the tip of Argentina, Tierra del Fuego, and back and back and back and back five times on horseback. His stamina in the saddle was absolutely legendary. And even the llaneros, who were the rough riders of Venezuela, they were the toughest horsemen uh, in the, on the whole continent, called him with all admiration, iron ass. <laughs> but as I say, he was equally comfortable in a ballroom or at the opera. He was a superb dancer, a spirited conversationalist, a cultivated man of the Enlightenment who read widely and could quote Rousseau or Julius Caesar in their own languages. He was a widower by the time he was 19 years old and a sworn bachelor. He said, I will never marry again. However, 
He was also an insatiable womanizer. Every time he rode in, having liberated a town or a province or a village or a city, young girls in white with blue ribbons would come running out to meet him. And he would choose from one or another to actually dance and spend the evening with. And there were always romances afoot. People were always pushing their daughters to Bolivar. He was a very rich man. He had been when he started, at least. And he was a very powerful man, a very extraordinarily influential man. So he was always presented with all of these lovely young women. He had 35 mistresses that we can count, or that are actually recorded in the books. Uh, the one wonderful Pepita Bachado, who followed him uh, across the Caribbean here and there, and then they would have these uh, extraordinary meetings of the love trysts in which, uh, in which Bolivar would stop all the boats and say, I'm stopping here and I'm going to see Pepita. And the soldiers and the generals or the admirals were, what? Um, they learned to live with that. Uh, then there was, of course, the, fa the famous Manuela Sáenz, who saved him many times from assassination attempts later on when his reputation became, he be had become dictator in several countries and his uh, the assassination attempts were tried. And Man Manuela Sáenz really was the one who saved his life. There are scenes in the book um, in which she dresses him in her galoshes because his boots have been sent out to be cleaned and he has to escape through the window in her galoshes to, um, to hide from the, uh, the potential assassins. By the time uh, Bolivar was galloping toward Bogota in that scene that I just described, his name was already known around the world. In Washington, John Quincy Adams and James Monroe agonized over whether the fledgling Republic of the United States in which a slave trade was booming should support a patriot army whose ranks were populated by liberated slaves. Think about that. The largest gross national product in the United States at that time was slavery. Cotton, tobacco, everything depended on slavery. The thought that a liberator would take freed slaves and prosecute a war of independence was anathema to uh, those in Washington, and so he got no help uh, from them. In London, he got no help from the officials, but out-of-work veterans of the Napoleonic Wars signed on to fight for Bolivar's cause. And it was, there were um, incredible scenes of these men who dressed up in London finery with their epaulettes and their fancy hats with feathers, and they show up in, of course, the tropics and the jungle, and everybody's fighting a war barefoot with lances. And here come these lumbering men with all of these, you know, fancy uniforms. They didn't have them for long. They didn't have them for long. Uh, those, the British and the Irish soldiers who fought alongside Bolivar really distinguished themselves in bravery and they learned to fight, if need be, with lances and barefoot. There would be a lot of, there would be much horrifying violence before Spain was thrust from South American shores. Whole towns would be razed, populations would be annihilated in a degree of truculence that had been unknown in the Americas of those times. In the battlefields of Venezuela alone, there were more dead than in the North American Revolution and Civil War combined. At the end of that chastening war, one man would be credited with conceiving, organizing, and leading the liberations of those six nations, a population that's one and a half times that of North America at the time. And the odds against which he fought a formidable established world power, vast areas of untracked wilderness, the splintered loyalties of many, many races would have proved daunting for the best of generals with strong armies at his command. But Bolivar had never been a soldier. He had no formal military training. Yet with little more than will and a genius for leadership, he freed much of the Spanish American continent and laid out his dream for a unified Latin America. 
He wanted one Latin America, one nation, a solid country that would serve at that point as a bulwark against what he felt was a hugely growing United States and a very powerful, still threatening Europe. Of course, he never won his dream. He was an astonishing man and yet a highly imperfect man. He could be impulsive, headstrong, filled with contradictions. He spoke eloquently about justice, but he wasn't always able to meet it out in the chaos of war. His romantic life had a way of spilling over into the public realm. His mistresses often got him into trouble with his generals. He had trouble accepting criticism. He had no patience for disagreements. He was totally incapable of losing at a game of cards. It's hardly surprising that over the years, Latin Americans have learned to accept human imperfections in their leaders. Bolivar taught them how. You wonder why in Peru, in the country where I was born, a president brings his illegitimate children out to the balcony without a grieving, sad-looking wife beside? Human imperfections, we know about them in our leaders in Latin America. As years passed, he became known as the George Washington of South America. This pleased him very much. And General Lafayette actually gave him that moniker. There were good reasons why. Both he and Washington came from rich, influential families. Both were defenders of freedom. Both were heroic in war, but apprehensive about marshalling the peace. And both resisted efforts to make them kings. Bolivar was very anti-monarchical, and it's strange because I still meet people today who say, oh, he's the one who wanted to be king of Latin America. Not so. And he, both he and George Washington, claimed to want to return to private lives, but were called instead to shape governments. And both were accused of undue ambition. And there the similarities end because Bolivar's military action lasted more than twice as long as Washington's. The territory he covered was almost seven times as large and spanned an astonishing diversity, from crocodile-infested jungles to the snow-capped reaches of the Andes. Moreover, unlike Washington's war, Bolivar's could not have been fought without the aid of black and Indian troops. His success in rallying all the races to his side was really the turning point for the wars of independence. It's fair to say that he simultaneously fought both a revolution and a civil war. But perhaps what distinguishes them most, I feel, is in their written works. In Washington's work, you see a measured, august, dignified man the product of a cautious and deliberate mind. Bolivar's speeches, on the other hand, were fiery, passionate, short, sharp. They represent, to my mind, some of the greatest writing in Latin America. Although much of this was produced in haste, as I said, in ballrooms and on the fly, in, uh, on the battlefield, and on the run, the prose is lyrical and stately, clever but historically grounded, electric, yet deeply wise. It's no exaggeration to say that Bolivar's revolution changed not only South America, but the Spanish language. The old dusty Castilian, that very ornate Baroque uh, Castilian of its time, in his voice and pen became something else entirely, urgent and vibrant and young. Unlike Washington's glory, Bolivar's did not last into the grave. In time, the politics in his countries grew ever more fractious. His detractors became ever more vehement. This is when the assassination attempts began. Eventually, he, became, he came to believe that Latin America could, was really not ready for a democratic government. He felt they had been made abject, they had been made ignorant, suspicious, 
because they had been systematically deprived of that experience by Spain's colonial rule for 300 years. What they needed in his eyes was a strong hand and a strict executive. He began making unilateral decisions. He installed a dictator in Venezuela. He wrote into the Bolivian constitution a president for life. Well, you can imagine these things did not sit well, particularly with generals who wanted to have a piece of the action territory to themselves and uh, land to rule of their own. By the time he was 41, his wisdom began to be doubted by Every, all the functionaries, many functionaries in, the, uh, every, in every republic that he liberated. His deputies became jealous and wary of his extraordinary power. They called it the magic of his prestige, which, by the way, still lives on today. Uh, you don't find people running through the streets of Washington yelling, George Washington, George Washington. You don't find people running through the streets of London yelling, Cromwell, Cromwell. But in the streets of South America, in Venezuela, in Colombia, you do find people running through the streets yelling, Bolivar. Hugo Chavez did help with that. Trumped at last by all the divisions in his uh, second, third of command, he had no choice but to renounce command. His 47th and final year ended in poverty, illness, and exile. He had come from one of the richest families of Venezuela that had 12 houses in Caracas, mines of copper, uh, fields of indigo, fields of sugar, and he had reduced his wealth to nothing for the revolution. He died, in fact, entirely penniless, the doctor that uh, cared for him until the end and did his autopsy had to go down the street to borrow a shirt in which to bury Bolivar. Well, of course, we know what the end of the story is. Twelve years later, he was, was brought back from Santa Marta where he died. He had, been, he had died forbidden to come back to Venezuela on his way out of Colombia, totally despised for all that he had accomplished, uh, a most amazing ingratitude. And of course, uh, 12 years later, they wanted him back. They wanted his body back in, the, in, the, um, in Caracas, in the cathedral. They left his heart in an urn because Colombia didn't want them to take his heart away. And he became the most, as we say, in merfilado, you, there's no uh, English word for it, in marbled person in all of Latin America. And those marble statues are all over. You can find them here in Washington, the iron, bon wonderful bronze statues. You can find them in New York. Uh, it is indeed a most amazing, and I hope you agree with me, quite a compelling American story. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. We have a little time for questions. I'd love to take your questions. We have a few minutes. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed reading Bolivar. You Thank have you. beautifully dramatized history. Thank you. Now, here is a history question. What, in, in your opinion, is the single most important reason that George Washington succeeded in having a United States of America, but a charismatic figure like Bolivar failed. Well, with Bolivar, he never had the, the uh, circle that surrounded George Washington, that extraordinary circle of men, of Madison and Hamilton. And, and uh, Bolivar never had that. He had, he, uh, he had uh, military men he had rescued out of, really out of nowhere, uh, as young soldiers, brought them up the ranks, and uh, at the at the 11th hour, uh, they were not wise, they were not necessarily um, helpful in creating the unified uh, vision that he had. The, um, there was no, uh, no team of rivals. 
Uh, and when it descended into chaos, Bolivar totally understood why, in a sense. It was because uh, the, uh, the Latin Americans had never been given any responsibility. Spain, people don't realize this is a very fundamental difference between the North American and the South American experience. South Americans, uh, under the colonial rule, were given absolutely no responsibility. You could not grow a plum tree to sell the plums. You could not go down the shaft to mine your own copper if you were living over copper. You could not uh, go from one colony to another without risking arrest. You could not uh, publish anything. You could not read anything. It was a tremendously controlled environment and Bolivar thought completely an infantilized environment. And Latin Americans did not learn until, well, when uh, independence was given, it was given it, it really, uh, in his eyes, to children who didn't know how to manage it. And it has taken, you know, now you see, in a way, uh, a lot of very prophetic things that Bolivar said at the time coming to pass. Uh, he wrote some remarkable things. He saw countries, whole countries, being exactly what they are today. He saw Chile as it is today, an engine of productivity. He saw Panama as having a canal, which of course was way before uh, it happened. Um, but he felt that, uh, and it was true, there was just no organized um, uh, wisdom to help him. Thank you for the question. Uh, I had a question. Was the inspiration for the uh, South American uh, revolutions I understand one of the crucial things is it was not from, an, from America, it was from the French Revolution. And would that have had, a, uh, had an effect on how, how they viewed things? And the second thing I was thinking about is what was his relationship with O'Higgins and San Martin? Thank you. Um, well, uh, the French Revolution, well, you know, basically, Napoleon, in a way, handed independence to Latin America by invading Spain. At the time, you know, you can imagine, it wasn't social media time, there was no, no uh, quick communications. Uh, at the time, there was the sleepy colony uh, in Venezuela, in Caracas, they did not learn that Napoleon had t invaded Spain and taken over Spain until six months after the fact, and they only knew it because somebody read the shipping news uh, that had been sent over from the Dominican, at uh, the time from, uh, from what is now the Dominican Republic, had sent over you know, some old English newspapers that were five months old. And somebody was looking at the shipping news and they sa it said something about, oh, we can't go to those ports anymore because it's ta been taken over by Napoleon. This is how Venezuela learned that it no longer had a colonial master. The, um, the, the French the, the, the French had a great deal to do. In fact, Napoleon had a great deal to do with uh, uh, getting the independence movement started because it was an opportunity. You know, if Spain is in trouble, this is a time to revolt. Uh, actually, the only, uh, France did not help at all except for that, for invading Spain. The one nation, the one president, the one uh, leader who actually helped Bolivar was the president of Haiti. And now today, you know, you go to Haiti, everybody knows Simon Bolivar's name because uh, Haiti feels, and rightfully so, that um, they really helped make Latin America independent. It was Alexander Petion, uh, who during one of the, uh, it was the second exile of Bolivar, uh, Alexander Petion said, I will help you. I will introduce you to, you know, whoever, the shipping merchants, the, the, uh, the Caribbean um, people with boats, I will help you, but you have to promise me one thing. And Bolivar said, what is that? I need your help, what is that? And uh, Petion said, you have to, the moment you step foot, on Venezuela again, you have to free the slaves. Bolivar actually knew that. It was confirmation of what he had already learned. He had already been spit out of Venezuela twice and he knew that he couldn't go forward without the help of the races. But it was Haiti, the only Haiti, who helped him at that point. Over here. My mom was born in Peru and she and I watched this documentary together called Girl Rising 
And one of the stories was about a Peruvian girl named Senna, who grew mm. up in one of the mining towns, and I saw that it was written by you. And I was wondering how important you think it is for not only adults, but also for youth to learn about the Latin American experience and what it's like to grow up in those countries. What it's like to grow up now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that question. She's referring, a uh, wonderful question, thank you, referring to uh, a movie that was released in April called Girl Rising. And it was a, a movie that I had the opportunity to write part of the script for. I wrote the script that was on, on a Peruvian girl. The message of the, of the movie is, um, and this is, comes directly from social science, if you educate girls, you can change the fabric uh, of a community. You can change the fabric of, of a whole uh, of a whole village, of a whole town, uh, because it, and this, the science proves this out. Um, when girls are educated, the, act, the, the, the household becomes healthier, uh, the disease goes down, the, um, uh, the, the crime goes down, everything, it all tracks with the education of girls. Um, this is the sort of thing, and you know, thank you, because in my mind, at least, it connects. It's something that Bolivar knew immediately. What he did when he got, went from town to town, uh, he set up universities, he set up uh, educational centers. He left and they all fell apart. Uh, you know, and uh, in the climate that this movie uh, encourages and suggests, it's stick with it, stay there, educate, the, the, the children and, um, you know, concentrate on the girls, especially in Latin America where girls don't have a whole lot of power. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I think, are we running out of time? We have time for one more question? Please. Thank you. I just want to thank you for your contribution. I think it's important for us to learn about Latin America. I'm curious, you've talked about Hispanic culture a lot, uh, mainly it sounds like it's a synonym for the Spanish-speaking countries of Latin America. Could you comment a little bit on the Portuguese influence or Brazil? Did you see interaction with Bolivar and the Portuguese or, or the Brazilians? Thank you. Uh, Brazil had a very different history. What happened, of course, uh, is when Napoleon came in and, and invaded the, uh, the peninsula, the Portuguese royal family got into uh, boats, a whole, uh, uh, a convoy of boats and sailed to Brazil, which was their colony. So they transplanted the royalty to Brazil and they felt they kept uh, the Portuguese power and the po Portuguese monarchy going. It was a very different story from, from the rest of Spanish-speaking America. There really is a distinction there and uh, it would be wonderful to actually have a book that compared the difference of the experiences between the Brazilian, uh, quite different, and, and uh, somehow much tidier experience, uh, at least in, in terms of revolution and in terms of, of uh, uh, governance than the rest of Latin America. Thank you for that question, and thank you once again for having me here and for listening. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.